Our next speaker is going to be Jerry Stucka. He's our extension veterinarian and livestock stewardship person, professor. You know, every speaker that this evening has talked about the value of cattle has changed dramatically. And I think it's wise for us to think about this whole issue of weaning stewardship. And it goes much beyond that. When we have $1,500 calves, I think we need to heighten our sense of animal husbandry and think about saving as many calves as we possibly can. It's not just at weaning time, but it's at birthing time, and it's about getting cows pregnant. Um, I think this has become more important all the time. And, you, may, you know, we've gone for many years, we're thinking, well, I don't want to spend too much on this cow. I don't want to spend too much on this calf because it's not going to, it's not going to pay back. If you've got $1,500 calves and $2,500 pregnant cows or whatever they are today, that changes that whole equation. You might, may find yourself looking to your veterinarian more than you ever thought before because they, now each individual animal is worth that much more. So I think we just need to shift our focus perhaps a little bit when, when these cattle prices are what they are. <clears throat> I put this in here to start with because I want us to think about all the things that come into an animal's life that results in stress that increases the risk of cattle getting sick. And for all of these things except one in, in this whole collage of pictures, there's no vaccines for it. Uh, the stress associated with shipping. There's no vaccine to protect the stress associated with bad weather. There's no vaccine to, associate, the, to protect against the stress associated with just simple weaning or commingling of cattle or even how we handle them. So when it comes to weaning time, we need to be aware of our animal husbandry skills, how we handle cattle, how we handle them through the chute, because in many cases those are much more important areas uh, for us than what vaccines we buy and use. So what I want to do this evening, there is no handouts with mine because we're just going to look at pictures. The reason I'm, I'm doing this is that I want us to be better at identifying cattle that don't feel well. Okay. I want us to be able to identify cattle that are just thinking about maybe not, not feeling well. Just think about getting sick. So what I put up here is what is a pull like? And I think I actually a couple of weeks ago presented this slide to a, a class at NDSU, and then I realized, you know, there are students in this class that don't understand the term pull. What's a pull? Well, a pull for all of us in this room and those of you listening just means an animal that doesn't look like it's doing very well probably sick and I'm going to pull it from the pen and treat it. So we've identified whether we're on horseback or whether on foot or whether we're 100 feet away, an animal that doesn't feel well. We're going to try and pull it out of the pen and make a better determination as to whether that animal is sick or not. But in order to do that, we have to understand what a healthy animal looks like as well. We have to have it in our minds and we, we need to be able to, art, I would say, articulate this, especially to people that don't understand animal behavior. What's a healthy calf look like? Well, they ought to be able to eat. They ought to have a good appetite. They should be bright-eyed. You ever tried to teach somebody what a bright-eyed animal looks like? It's not easy, okay? But those of us that spend a lot of time around animals, you can tell an, a an animal with an eye that's just a little dull. They may be just starting to feel bad, feel sick, but it's a very, a very slight difference between that eye and a bright-eyed animal. They should have good hair coats. They should be able to groom themselves and, and a lot of times lick others as well. And they should be curious. Now, sometimes they're curious from a quarter of a mile away, depending on their temperament, or others like those black steers up there will come right up to the gate. And if they're Holsteins, they'll try and take whatever you got in your pocket. What are the signs and symptoms that we need to be aware of cattle that aren't feeling well? Okay. I would hope that anybody looking at this slide would have no trouble identifying this cattle as not feeling well. I think cattle sometimes just feel bad when they're in mud, okay? I think, Carl, they're a little bit depressed when they got mud around them. So it sometimes makes the signs and symptoms even worse. Just a little bit of an academic issue here. It's not a big deal, but signs 
are different than symptoms. Symptoms are saying that calf looks depressed. Okay, that's a subjective term, isn't it? I don't know how depressed or if it's depressed at all. When we're talking about signs, that means I've stuck a thermometer in that calf and he's 104 and a half. One's objective, one's kind of subjective. Not a big deal, it's just kind of academic, but we use all of those terms to determine whether an animal's feeling well or not. The other thing I think it's important for us to recognize, and, and most of the time when we're talking about wean calves, what's the number one body system that we're talking about that that's going to impact that calf? It's the lungs. It's the respiratory system. That's the big one far and away. But we also have to recognize that other body systems become impacted with other pathogens or other metabolic diseases. Could be a digestive upset, could be musculoskeletal issues, lame cattle, cattle riding one another. Could be central nervous system issues like polio, for example. Or it could be urogenital issues like uh, steers that become plugged with urinary calculi. Okay? So a lot of different body systems can be involved. Respiratory system for background and calves by far and away the number one system that we'll, we'll identify. I've actually put some cartoon pictures. I created these a long, long time ago, and I thought they still kind of fit because they, they overemphasize some of the signs that you might see. But really, one of the first ones to notice is a reluctance to come to the feed bunk. And sometimes you don't need to... In fact, I would argue sometimes it's better not to be in the pen to notice this. Even the feed truck driver or the guy pulling the feed wagon can identify this pretty quickly. Normally, calves that are hungry that are being fed for the first time in the morning, they're going to come up and eat. If you've got calves that are hanging back, unless it's early in the weaning period, because they don't know how to come up and eat yet, a normal healthy calf will come up to that bunk and, and eat. Reluctance to come to the feed bunk is a, is that a sign or a symptom? Maybe just a symptom. For those that don't understand animal anatomy even, which flank is, is a lot of times going to be one, the one that's hollow? Well, it's going to be where the rumen is. So on the left side of the animal, as you're looking from the back end of that animal, that's the flank that's going to be hollow. Okay, If we see a hollow animal, either it's not drinking or he's not eating or he's not doing either ones. So gaunt, hollow animals are abnormal. An animal that's not gaining weight or keeping up with his pen mate, and any animal that lacks appetite at least needs further scrutiny. You may not like to pull them right away, but you better keep an eye on that animal because some of these respiratory... Uh, pathogens can move very quickly uh, and cause some pretty severe lung damage. There's one. This one actually happens to be on the, on the right side that you're looking at here. That's an animal that hasn't drunk and hasn't eaten for some time. Is that animal sick at this point? Don't really know, do we? Okay, don't really know. That's an animal that has arrived at a stalker operation, been there maybe five, six hours, been on a long truck ride, some of those things you can expect. What's the first thing you notice about cattle that have been along, on a long truck ride have been through an auction barn, through the ring, and then on a long truck ride? They want to lay down, don't they? They're tired, okay? So don't confuse just being tired with being ill either. There's one that's with a gaunt, empty flank on the left side. I will tell you, I took this picture, and it was a cold, rainy day. That animal was actually not sick. He was just cold and wishing he was back in, in the southeast someplace. Sometimes we get calves with coughing and nasal discharge and rapid respiratory rate. What can increase respiratory rate? Well, warm temperatures can. An animal that's excited, an animal that's been sorted many times, an animal with a fairly um, wild temperament, one that's a little wild will, will expend more energy and have a higher respiratory rate. If it's an animal with pneumonia, it might have a higher respiratory rate as well. Some coughing can be normal as they try and clear those nasal passages and, and, and trachea. Nasal discharges, I don't get too concerned about it. Um, if it's a nasal discharge and the animal will not clean its nose, sometimes you come out in the morning and see these long, ropey uh, snot coming out of the nose and it doesn't clean its nose, that's a concern to me. Okay? If it's an animal that's just getting up in the morning it's got a little snot coming out, and he's able to stick that tongue up there and kind of clean things out. I'm not too concerned about that. Drooped head and ears arched back. Why does an animal do that? Well, he's not feeling well, right? Um, that, that's the definition that we sometimes use to indicate depression. You know, is that animal actually clinically depressed? I have no idea, but he's not feeling well, right?
An animal like that, I'm going to make sure I take a second look at them. And sometimes those animals, even at that stage when you first notice them, can have lung damage at that point. What we're looking at here on this slide is the, uh, the right side. This is right lung tissue. You can see that lighter colored lung tissue at the top of that picture. That's relatively normal. There are normal patches of lung tissue in there. At the bottom there, that, cr that one half of that lung on the bottom side, on the lower part of that lung. So all of this area down on, the, on the, what we call the ventral part of this lung, the lower part of this lung, can't get air through. It's all congested. It's all diseased. It can't, that animal cannot exchange oxygen in this part of the lung. Okay? What is always amazing to me is how those animals can look so normal and have that much lung damage. Crusted muzzle, sunken eyes, rough, dry-looking coat. If we see animals with sunken eyes, what's that tell us right away? Dehydrated, right? That's a dehydrated animal. So an animal that's got dehydration, sunken eyes, and he's got snot coming out of his nose, he's got a dry-looking hair coat, I'm really concerned about that animal, okay? That animal may indeed have a condition that's untreatable. In fact, this calf right here in that picture on the right here, right, this one. This one actually has BVD. It was a persistently infected BVD calf. And that animal, once they become sick, they don't recover. They'll go ahead and die. Some of those cattle will have labored breathing. They might be groaning, grunting, snoring, or coughing. If we look at this animal on the right here again, obviously it doesn't have a gas mask like the cartoon does, but it needs one. See how that neck is extended here? This animal's trying everything it can to move air. That tells you right off that that animal's got pretty severe lung damage. You're, pro you're more than likely too late. You may be able to treat that animal and may be able to salvage him, but more than likely that animal's not going to survive all the way through the finishing period. This is an animal that's a little bigger, a little older, and, and we're too late on this animal. Okay? He's got his neck extended. He's slobbering at the, at the mouth. He's trying his best to move air. That's too late of a pull, and, and we're going to end up losing an animal like that. Some of those animals have pretty severe lung damage. You can look, see this lung tissue here is almost totally involved. In fact, if, you could, if I could blow this up a little har larger, we're unable to in this room. This, this looks like a combination of a, of a bacterial and a viral infection in that lung. Could even be BRSV involved in here. This one hit down here in the lower left side, this is, we're looking inside from the, from the back of that animal, we're peering into the thorax. And what you see here with these little tags, that's what we call pleuritis. That's, in humans we use the term pleurisy. That means that that animal not only had an infection in the lung, but it has an infection in the lining of the thorax, in the pleura, and you're getting these tags. And when you get those kind of tags, that animal not only has difficulty moving air, but it's very painful for those animals to move air. And that's when you sometimes get that grunting involved because there's pain associated with that. That's too late, right? You know, I'll just make this point right now because I may forget later on. We really don't want animals to get to this point, do we? Okay? We really would not, we would really not like to treat any animals at all when we either buy calves or our own calves. Our goal as cow-calf people that keep our own calves and background our calves is to have as little sickness as possible, to prevent as much illness as possible. And it makes a difference not just on what vaccines we use, but how those cattle are raised from the time that calf is in utero till his calf was born till we wean them. So our animal husbandry skills are important all the way through the life of that calf in preventing some of these things that occur here. It's not just the bug. It's how that animal was raised. One of the things I see, too, in some of these cattle that are sick, um, they may start having other symptoms as well. They may uh, show lameness, an abnormal gait. The ones I've seen that are really tired um, and maybe just starting to get sick, if the pens are dry, you'll notice those back feet kind of drag in the dirt a little bit and they'll kick up a little dust. That's a really early symptom that that calf's not feeling well. He may be doing everything he can to, to hide his symptoms from you. When you see that, that foot starting to drag in, in the, in the uh, pen surface, kick, kicking up a little dirt, you may want to take a little, little bit better look at that calf, even though he's trying to fool you and, and getting you thinking that 
he's not ill. Sometimes we indeed have real lameness going on. That calf on the upper left-hand corner there, that's a calf that actually has mycoplasma infection in the joints. This calf here is showing us signs of foot rot, pretty severe foot rot at, at this case. So all lameness, I just want to make this point, all lameness is not foot rot. It can be injury, it could be infectious, foot, uh, infectious lameness like this mycoplasma calf, or indeed sometimes it can be foot rot. I show this here because this is one of the most frustrating lamenesses that occur. This is a, a hoof here that's actually been uh, cut lengthwise. And so what you're looking at down here is the sole. This is the front part. And what happens on some of these cattle, particularly if they've gone through, not necessarily auction markets, but if they've been sorted a number of times and they tend to be a little bit wilder type of cattle, they can actually wear the bottom sole of their foot off and, and inter you get introduced into here some filth and some bacteria and they get what we call toe abscesses. It's one of the more frustrating lamenesses to, to treat. It does, the foot never looks swollen and yet that infection is there and will stay there until you try it, until you open up those toes and, and allow drainage to occur. So if you have cattle that are extremely lame on one foot, don't see any swelling, will barely put that foot down, do everything they can to avoid touching that. It's like having the worst blister in the world underneath one of your fingernails. That's how painful that is. You, you have to go in there and, and lift up those feet and actually examine the feet and put a hoof tester on there and see if you can't find that little abscess. Because they're very painful, those cattle won't do very well. Ultimately, ultimately cattle with these toe abscesses, it will, cr it will travel up the hoof and bust out on the, at the top of the hoof wall and you'll get some drainage coming out here. By then it's too late because usually the joint here has been destroyed. What I'm trying to show down here is just a hoof that I nipped off at the end just to create a little bit of drainage. This calf up in the upper right here, this is when we sometimes get a little bit carried away with our high grain diets or highly fermentable carbohydrates in the diet. We actually can cause cattle to be foundered or, in, uh, or have what we would call laminitis. And those cattle will walk pretty characteristically, trying to keep their feet out in front of them, trying to spread the rate out as much as they can. Those feet are very painful, just like they would be in a horse that's been foundered. So sometimes you get those things going on in a particular pen of cattle. This is mycoplasma arthritis, and the reason I'm showing you this lung over here is that that infection you usually, I should say, almost always starts in lung tissue. And then to use a term for, for uh, from cancer, it would metastasize, if you will, or get to the joint tissues. This is a knee joint that have opened up, and here's wonderful dried up pus in that joint. These cattle are extremely lame. Uh, very hard to turn this calf around, even with um, even with the best antibiotics they, that we have. I will tell you that some veterinarians have actually tried to inject antibiotics into these joints. Uh, with some having a little bit of success. If it gets this bad, it's not going to work. And I bring that up with the veterinarian involvement because with cattle the price they are, don't consider them to be a total loss, but you need to catch these as early as you possibly can too in order to prevent it from getting to this stage. Loner animals deserve special attention. And I will reiterate this again. In many cases, sick animals will try and hide among their pen mates just so that you can't see them. I've even had cattle walk up to the bunk, stick their head in the bunk and not eat anything just to hide from you. But sometimes those loner animals are, are exhibiting or having other issues going on that may warrant a little bit more attention. And that's when we get into these central nervous system disorders. Okay, I've got two different ones here. The one on the upper right here is a polio calf. Typically those calves will have seizures. That eyeball will be kind of sometimes point it up, but they'll have seizures and, and uh, you know, sometimes we get polio calves in the background yard or in the finishing yard uh, when we get uh, thiamine deficiencies or sometimes when you have too high of sulfur levels in the diet and that's been associated with sometimes our, our feeding our byproducts, the dried or the distiller's grains that we currently use. And so sometimes you'll get these polio cases, okay? We, we call them CNS, we call them brainers in layman's terms, and you're not always sure what the cause is. 
uh, treatment is not very successful when they get to this stage. This calf down here is a calf that we call nervous coccidiosis. They're always interesting. Their ears will be kind of out and they kind of tremble. You try and move those cattle to a treatment facility and invariably they will stumble and fall with their front legs going down first. And then they will go into seizures as well. You can treat those calves and it seems like 50% case fatality rate on those calves. The only reason we call it nervous coccidiosis at this stage is that it seems to be associated with coccidiosis, but we're not sure what actually causes the symptoms or the, yeah, that we see associated with the brain. The only other CNS disease I talk to you about in North Dakota, and that's rabies. Every once in a while we get rabies in cattle. Sometimes we get cattle with diarrhea, even in big cattle, uh, backgrounding operations and finishing operations. Again, with, with frank blood in, in the, or blood in the stool like this one has over here, we might, that might be coccidiosis. It also could be salmonellosis. And it's wise to remember that when you see this kind of condition, it's probably, it's okay to think about coccidiosis, but don't forget about salmonella because that can be a, a disease that people can get as well. This is just a couple, this is a close up picture of what I would characterize as a, uh, pool of manure in, in the pen that I associate with being in a calf that's acidotic. This is looking at the uh, digestive tract of a calf. In this case, this calf had BVD in its system. High fevers in cattle, normal fever, normal temperatures in cattle would be 101.5 plus or minus two. Typically, I will use 103.5 and higher to, tell, uh, to indicate a calf that has a fever that I need to be concerned with. Others, you will use 104 and higher. If, you, if the environmental temperature is hot outside, it's easy to get those those uh, fevers up a little bit, even 103, 103 and a half is not uncommon. But if I'm seeing signs and symptoms associated with a calf not feeling well, and he's 103 and a half, I'm, I'm definitely going to uh, intervene with some type of treatment in a calf like that. We occasionally see heart problems in cattle. Sometimes histophilus is an organism that can cause cardiac lesions. In this case, got an abscess right in the wall of the heart. Right here, that's pus coming out of the wall of that heart. Sometimes we get cattle that don't have enough uh, pumping ability in their, in their circulatory system, and fluid starts to build up, sometimes in the brisket, sometimes under the jaw. This calf over here was a, somewhat of a parasitized animal that you hardly ever see anymore. But these cattle here, there's virtually no treatment when you get to this stage. I mean, we covered a lot of body systems in a short period of time, but I think it behooves us all to get used to, or I do a better job of observing, observing cattle behavior, finding cattle that are sick almost just when they're thinking about getting depressed. Observe undisturbed cattle from a distance. Cattle that are strange to your situation will try and hide themselves. If cattle are laying down in the pen, don't just let them lay there. Have them get up. They may be lame. There may be some, something else that you may be aware, aware of. And then always work cattle in a low-stress mantle and work them slowly. Talked about a lot of things, covered a lot of ground. But I think our animal husbandry skills today are, are worth more probably in the last number of years and will be for at least a, a number of years ahead. And we need to do the best job at stewardship and taking care of these cattle as we can.